When Corsair announced they were launching a laptop, the Voyager A1600, they didn't just tease us a little and show us the processor and the graphics. Nope. They yanked open the kimono the whole way and gave away all the details. So that's going to make this review tough because I've got to come up with something interesting to show you. Something that you don't already know. First impressions of the Corsair Voyager A1600 are that it's a bigger version of the Asus ROG Zephyrus G14 in the sense that it has a Quad HD display and it's all AMD hardware. There are significant differences, the most notable being 16 inch display versus 14 inch on the Asus. I'm not going to do a comparison of the Corsair versus the Asus, but we like the Asus and the guts of both laptops have a fair amount in common. Depending on which version of the Voyager A1600 you buy, you get either a Ryzen 7 or a Ryzen 9 processor. However, they each have eight cores and 16 threads. The difference is down to the clock speed. This panel is a 240 Hertz IPS and the graphics in the Corsair are full on RX 6800M rather than RX 6800S. You get 25% more shaders, about 200 extra megahertz on the core speed, and you have 12 gig of memory rather than eight. That suffix on the graphics makes a significant difference to the specification. How it performs in practice, we shall see. In the package, you get the laptop, a 230 watt power adapter, and this protective sleeve, which is fairly basic. I was teased by Corsair. They included this backpack, but that is not part of the deal with the Voyager laptop, despite its price. We'll come to that in a bit. We're told this backpack is for the first group or batch of laptops that they sell. Don't know how many that is. And thereafter, you don't get it. I presume you can buy it as an accessory. Not sure on the price. Knowing Corsair, it won't be cheap. So shame that you can remove that from your site. So we have the laptop and you will note we have some Corsair software. Corsair Voyager Hub walks you through some of the software that's included with the Voyager laptop, including IQ. You also get information about setting up your webcam, how to use AMD's Adrenaline software and help with Dolby Audio. Within Corsair IQ, you can work with the Slipstream module to hook up Corsair wireless peripherals without the usual USB dongles. You can also change the Capellix lighting settings for the Voyager keyboard with its cherry switches. And if you like, you can change the presets for the S key macro bar. The cooler has three settings and these have a dramatic effect on the performance and cooling of the Voyager laptop. The three power profiles are based on AMD SmartShift technology, which treats the CPU and the GPU as a combined bucket of power requirement. So the amount of power being fed to that pool of hardware, it shifts around, hence the name. Obviously this only works because the chipset, processor, graphics are all made by AMD. In fact, both the adding graphics and the iGPU are by AMD. So technically both graphics. Anywho, all the hardware AMD, the controlling software AMD, therefore they can do clever dynamic stuff. The result can look rather complicated. We have the three power modes, balanced, quiet and extreme, and in turn running on 230 watts, i.e. the mains adapter, 100 watts, that would be USB type C, and battery power. So that gives us nine options. And then we have the figure for combined smart shift, CPU dominant, 
and GPU dominant, you can see most of the power goes to the GPU. You can expect naturally the quiet profile to deliver least performance, balanced to be the middling performance, and extreme to be maximum, that's common sense. But of course you've also got to allow for cooling. There we are in quiet mode, and let's start Time Spy running. And the laptop is indeed quiet. Step up to balanced mode, noticeably louder. And extreme performance pretty much speaks for itself. In the three modes, there's very little difference in the power target for the CPU and the GPU. However, the combined power target changes quite significantly. And we see this in our test results. Look at the CPU part of Time Spy, very little difference between the three power modes. Whereas in the graphics test, there's a big difference. Clearly the system is feeding more power to the GPU as we step up in capability. And this plays out in the overall score where there are big steps as we go up through the modes. The S key bar, we have 10 touchscreen buttons, five either side of a central widget currently set to show battery meter, or we can toggle across to clock. Five buttons, Corsair set some of them to give us little functions, S1, toolbar, S2, opens a YouTube channel, so Corsair Voyager tutorials, S3, Voyager 2, already seen this, S4, opens IQ, you get the general flavor of the thing. And if you choose within IQ, we can then play around with the S bar. So for example, we can change the lighting effects on static color at the moment, Corsair yellow, as you can see, if you want, you can change the assignments or indeed you can change the screen, the central widget. And if you feel no need for the buttons or indeed the widget, you can choose to turn them off. There we go, widget gone. There we go, whole lot off, and back it comes. Let's take a look at the slipstream module that's controlled by Corsair's IQ software. Each of these peripherals, mouse, keyboard, headset, uh, can be connected wirelessly or cabled to your PC laptop or games console. Uh, and they come with the dongles. So for the mouse, it's that little one there, for the keyboard, that there, and for the headset, it's this hefty great big dongle here. That's significant. If you are connecting the devices independently, you could connect all three dongles simultaneously, and that's it, job done. Obviously it requires three USB ports. If you're using Slipstream Multipoint, then you can connect multiple devices to a dongle, and there's an order of priority. But if you have a mouse keyboard headset, it's the headset dongle that that is the important one. So you plug them in in the correct order and then the single dongle, the firmware is updated, controls all the devices. According to the reviewer's guide, the module built into the laptop can take the place of all three dongles. So let us see how that works. The snag appears to be uh, that to connect them wirelessly, you first need to connect them wired. And that means you need to connect all the devices simultaneously, which means you need multiple USB ports. You've got three type C's, one type A, but all of these devices are type A at the console PC laptop end of things. They're type C at the device end. So adapters, here we go. Type A to type C. Start with the mouse. I'm gonna connect that natively to the type A. Then we'll go with the keyboard, type C, and the headset, type C. So far so good. Additional devices, pair. Apparently we're finished, remove all USB cables. Okay, mouse works, keyboard works, headset appears in the audio devices, so slipstream is a go. I used a certain amount of trial and error before I decided to use the Type A to Type C adapters. Um, whether it's the correct approach or not, I honestly cannot say at the moment. However, it did do the job. These devices connect simultaneously over wireless and they function as they ought. This might be a good time to look at the ports and connectors. On the right side of the laptop, we have one USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type C, one USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A, and a full-size SDXC card reader. 
On the left side, we have the Kensington lock, AC power in, a microphone headphone combo jack, and two USB 4 Type C's. If you want to connect an external monitor or two to your Voyager laptop, you'll either need USB C connected monitors or you'll have to have some dongles that convert from USB C, i.e., Thunderbolt 3, over to DisplayPort or HDMI. You don't get any dongles with this laptop. You may also have noted there's no Ethernet on this laptop, it's Wi Fi only. Let's take a look inside the Voyager, see what's going on with the hardware. We remove a few screws, cover lifts away nice and easy, and it's amazingly conventional. We have a full-size 99 watt hour battery, making the most of the 16 inch chassis, vapor chamber cooler on the CPU, GPU, Corsair Vengeance branded DDR5 memory, somewhat surprisingly, a Samsung SSD, I would have bet money it would be Corsair, an empty M.2 slot over there for future expansion, speakers, Wi-Fi card. Actually very little to surprise us. Although you might have thought that Corsair would be the type of company to have windows in the cover so you could see their branded hardware inside. And that's what powers the Corsair Voyager A1600. It's time to take a look at performance. I tested the A1600 in all three power modes, quiet, balanced and extreme because it makes a significant difference to how the laptop performs. So here we go. We've already taken a quick look at 3D Mark scores earlier in this review. Let's look at them again. In the CPU score, we can see the ASUS ROG Zephyrus in balanced mode just beats the Corsair in balanced mode. In essence, it's a tie. Peculiarly, the extreme mode CPU test is slower than the balanced mode as demonstrated by the charts I showed you earlier in the review about how power is used inside this laptop. Overall, the Corsair Voyager does a reasonable job, but it's not brilliant. In the graphics element of Time Spy in extreme mode, the score's pretty blooming good. In balance mode, it's fine. In quiet mode, slow. And in the overall score of Time Spy, it's a similar story to the graphics. So extreme mode, pretty good. Balance mode, so-so. Quiet mode, fairly weak. Moving on to Blender. And we see that in extreme mode, the Corsair Voyager is head to head with the Zeus ROG Zephyrus. In balance mode, slightly slower. So that gives us a good reference point. And then in quiet mode, somewhat slower again to the tune of 20 seconds. Cinebench R23 Multicore, a pure CPU test. It doesn't matter which mode the Corsair Voyager is in, it does okay. Cinebench R23 Single Core, not so good. Bapco Crossmark, the Intel test, and we see the Corsair Voyager with its AMD hardware at the bottom of the chart. I'm not surprised to see that. The battery test, this is a bit of a peculiar one. As we saw, we have a 99 watt hour battery, which is significantly larger than the battery inside the ROG Zephyrus G14. However, the life of the battery is about five hours in PC Mark 10, where Luke got 10 hours from the ROG Zephyrus. I have no explanation. I'm just presenting the figures as I see them. And we move on to gaming tests. Far Cry 6 at 1080p. It doesn't matter if the Voyager is in extreme or balance mode. It does a good job in quiet mode or streaming mode, rather slow. Far Cry 6 at 1440 in extreme mode, it does a fine job. Balance mode, yeah, it's okay. Quiet mode, pretty blooming slow. At this stage, we can see the advantage of those full fat AMD graphics. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy at 1080p in extreme mode, that's an impressive frame rate. Balance mode, pretty blooming good. Quiet mode, Nothing to write home about. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy at 1440. Extreme mode, that's impressive. Balance mode, also good. Quiet mode, you wouldn't want to do it. Watch Dogs Legion at 1080p. Extreme mode, now that's playable. But balance mode and quiet mode, not so much. Watch Dogs Legion at 1440p can just about manage the job in extreme mode. Balance mode and quiet mode, to be forgotten about, I feel. If you've been paying close attention throughout this review, you will have noticed I have said nothing about pricing of the Corsair Voyager A1600, and that time has now come. Pricing in US dollars plus taxes, and if you want UK pricing in pounds, switch the dollar sign for a pound sign and add ink 
that. Oh, goodness gracious, £3,000 for this laptop. These prices are from Corsair's own web store, we're told, and Corsair's web store will be where you buy this laptop in the first instance. No doubt other stores will carry it in time. So the pricing is not tentative. That is Corsair's given figure. 3000 for this laptop is just too much. We have a larger SSD than the ASUS ROG Zephyrus G14. We have a 16-inch chassis versus 14, a bigger battery, but shorter battery life. We have full fat AMD graphics rather than the slightly cut down version, but a thousand pounds extra. Ooh, so Corsair customers, how much of a tax are you prepared to pay to Corsair? On past form, the answer is a lot, and it might be you're not the least bit fussed by hearing that there's mm, graphics, SSD, bits and pieces, the Slipstream Hub, at least £500 of extra cost in this laptop over and above what I feel it ought to be. Two and a half thousand I could live with, three grand, it's a lot. Uh, so I'll leave that one with you. I'm not impressed. Pros and cons, what do I think of the Corsair Voyager A1600? Pros, the good points. Decent build quality, no doubt about it. The screen is high quality. Uh, I haven't talked much about the screen, there's not much to say, it just does a fine job and I like it. The Corsair software transforms the Voyager into a hub for Corsair peripherals and uh, their associated companies. Uh, well, yes, true. If you're a Corsair streamer, you're probably looking at this thinking, well, I, bu I bought it 15 minutes ago. What are you talking about, Leo? In which case, I can't really argue with you. Uh, you're either in the Corsair camp or you're not. I suspect this might convert a few streamers to the Corsair camp, in which case it would have done the exact job they're intending. And finally, the illuminated power jack, which I haven't mentioned at all. There's a little white LED ring around the power jack so you can easily find the cord to plug it into your laptop in a dim environment. This is quite bright, uh, but if you're working in a dark room with lights in your face, that could be handy. It's a nice little touch. Cons, the negatives, the price is far too high, as I've already mentioned. The chassis is a magnet for fingerprints. We say this about so many laptops. I've cleaned this laptop down a good many times. And when I was uh, doing some of the uh, early testing, I was actually wearing gloves. Uh, it's just a swine for fingerprints. But if you're not showing the laptop on camera, if you're using it, that might not be an issue. Battery life is unimpressive. I don't understand the battery figures. Uh, I did multiple tests and I got but a few minutes variance, uh, 310 minutes, 313 minutes. So perfectly decent, but not a patch on the Zeus ROG Zephyrus, which is similar hardware and a smaller battery. It's a mystery to me. I suspect that Corsair is going to find more battery life as they update uh, the BIOS in particular. Corsair does not include dongles for USB-C, uh, USB 4 to HDMI and to DisplayPort. That just strikes me as a silly move. They, they've gone with the thin form factor and Type-C's galore, no graphics outputs. And you don't get an Ethernet port or a networking dongle. That's less of a concern to me than the graphics, but this is a premium laptop. They're charging plenty for the privilege, and I wish to goodness they'd just make our lives easy. Overall, it's a seven and a half worth considering. I was close to an eight worth buying, and I've dipped down slightly. So not a failure, not by any standards. And it's an interesting first take on laptops by Corsair. I'm looking forward to whatever they do next.